kidney stones are actually stones which are formed inside your body inside the organs called kidney now what happens the waste products of your body which are in the form of chemical salts which are supposed to be in dissolved state and they are excreted in your urine when they settle down inside the kidney in the urine and start making concretions which are like sand like particles these particles or what we call sediments they can come together and become harder and bigger in size and these are then called kidney stones so they are actually hard chemical substances which got precipitated inside the kidney in your urine and now they look like stones so they are called kidney stones kidney stones are of various types so we can divide them on the basis of their size on the basis of their shape on the basis of their chemical composition if we divide them on the basis of their size we call them small stones and big stones small stones are stones which are less than 6 mm they have a good chance of coming out without any surgical intervention big stones are more than 6 mm the chances of these stones coming out without any surgery are less then there are stones which are huge in size they are called stagon stones chemical composition is very important because it decides the hardness of the stone there are four basic chemicals which combine in different composition to form kidney stones calcium oxalate uric acid and phosphate now the commonest kidney stones are the calcium oxalate stones they are hard stones they are uh, painful stones and they take, they they sometimes need uh, surgical intervention laser surgery uh, to be removed from your body uric acid stones are not very common but they are softer in consistency and uh, many times they can be removed Uh, without much of an intervention phosphate stones are those stones which are usually formed in infected urine they are the stones which will not give you too much of pain and that's why they grow in size and uh, without giving you too much pain you don't pay attention to that discomfort and when they are huge in size only then they are noticed because now they are causing infections which are difficult to control and uh, they usually require surgical intervention and prolonged antibiotics so these are the common types of kidney stones kidney stones can present in variety of ways most of the time kidney stones are small in size and um, they don't create much of a problem many times they don't give you any pain no symptoms at all but when they do give symptoms it depends on their size and location if the stones are located inside your kidney they will give you some sort of discomfort and this discomfort can increase in severity and become a severe pain which will be located uh, on your right or left side mostly towards the back this pain has a tendency to move forwards towards the navel or towards the groin area and if the stone moves down in the pipe of urine the pipes which carry urine the pain starts traveling downwards when the stones have moved way down near your urinary bladder they can give you pain discomfort a sensation of irritation down in your tummy on the side where the stones are and many times they start giving you uh, symptoms of irritation of urinary bladder which are like um you will uh, you will have sensation of passing urine every few minutes the urine will start burning sometimes the patient also sees uh, blood in his or her urine and these are the common symptoms so pain in the side or in the front either on the right side or the left side plus uh, irritative urinary symptoms are the common signs of kidney stones but if the kidney stones uh, have been there for some time they sometimes cause infection and they can present with fever and um, bad infections also kidney stones are caused by many factors so there are hundreds of factors running behind the formation of kidney stones but basically 
uh, we must understand that the kidney stone formation uh, is mostly dependent upon your genetic factors. That means the chemical composition of your urine decides your tendency to form kidney stone. So we see that uh, kidney stones are much, much more common in northern India. They are not seen that frequently in south of the India. Uh, they are seen more frequently in uh, the American uh, continent, but they are not seen in some other continents. So they have some racial and genetic predisposition. This means that the urine of a person who has a genetic predisposition of kidney formation will uh, get the salts precipitated very early. Some of the risk factors being common to all of them. What are those risk factors? If a person is chronically dehydrated, the urine is concentrated and the salts which should be dissolved in the urine now start getting precipitated and they form kidney stones. So dehydration is first. Second, if your dietary intake is uh, mostly composed of uh, fast food, too much of sugar, too much of salt, these are common risk factors for kidney stone formation. High sugar and high salt content. In few people, there are certain chemicals in your diet which can lead to increased risk of kidney formation. And these people are who are having excess of oxalate excretion in their urine. So there are substances like spinach, uh, dry fruits, black tea, animal protein. So in those particular uh, people, uh, excess consumption of these uh, substances can increase the risk of kidney stone formation. Apart from these, there are certain hormonal imbalances in the body like excess secretion of parathyroid hormone, which can cause uh, stone formation. When we see kidney stone formation in, uh, in children, then we always suspect of some genetic disorder where composition of urine is very different from the normal person and it starts forming um, kidney stones at a very early age. So these are the common risk factors for kidney stones. Based on the uh, history, your symptoms and uh, physical examination, we uh, have a suspicion that this pain looks like a pain caused by kidney stone. And to confirm our diagnosis, we need a few tests. Most of the time it's just a simple ultrasound, which tells us about the presence or absence of a stone, the location of the stone, if the stone is big in size, causing obstruction or swelling of the kidney. So usually an ultrasound is good enough to diagnose a kidney stone. Sometimes if the stone is very small, uh, which is being missed on an ultrasound or if we are planning a surgical intervention then we need a CT scan. The CT scan tells us in details about the size, location and everything about the kidney stone. So the best investigation to diagnose a kidney stone remains a plain CT scan. But we also use uh, certain basic urine and blood tests to make sure that your urine is not infected with the stone lying inside it and um, uh, a few basic blood tests uh, which will tell us about the functioning status of your kidney. So just two or three basic tests are used to diagnose a kidney stone. Most of the time um, these are small stones and they don't require any surgery but they require certain changes in your lifestyle habits. Um, we advise our patients to drink a lot of water, keep themselves hydrated, and sometimes a small medicine which helps us in relaxing the urinary pipe from which from where the urine comes out and from where the stone is going to come out. So I would say uh, 60 to 70 percent of the patients um, will pass their stones, uh, their small stones, uh, only with uh, one simple medicine and a good hydration. Around 30% of the patients will get stones stuck somewhere which is not coming out with the medicines or to begin with if their stone is very large in size uh, which is not likely to come out they will require surgical intervention. So in early days we used to make big cuts. Open surgeries were done to remove the kidney stones from the kidneys or the urine pipes. But now we don't do those uh, surgeries anymore. Um, they, they used to be painful. The patient had to stay uh, in the hospital for many days. There were risk of bleeding. Now what we do, we have got 
very good uh, telescopes which are very small in size they have got excellent vision most of the time we don't need to make any cut on your body we use these telescopes goes in into your urinary bladder and from there we take these telescopes all the way up to your kidney and there we blast the stone with laser the laser turns the stone into dust this is the most advanced technology um, although it requires a lot of expertise it requires a lot of basic infrastructure uh, in the hospital from the um, uh, operation theater point of view needs experience because these telescopes are very small and they need to be maneuvered inside the kidney but if the expertise is available this is the best treatment option for any kidney stone where we don't make any cut the patient gets discharged next day the pain is nearly zero sometimes when the stone is very big in size we do a keyhole surgery where we make a small cut which is around few millimeters in size on the back and from there we take the telescope directly into the kidney and here now we can break the stones into multiple pieces and take them out so at the most we require a keyhole surgery most of the time we do it without any cut the surgery which is done without any cut is called rirs that is retrograde intrarenal surgery or FURS flexible ureteroscopic surgery the surgery which is done with a keyhole is called PCNL so these are the modalities which will uh, take care of kidney stones in any location and of any size first thing that you need to do is meet a qualified urologist and not take advice from friends or people who don't know about kidney stones so first thing is meet a good urologist discuss about what are the options available for you if you're not satisfied take a second opinion second if you have a kidney stone which is not obstructing the kidney it is not causing any swelling in the kidney on your ultrasound your blood reports are normal and you don't have too much pain or fever only then you are supposed to follow these advices you have to hydrate yourself drink at least 3 liters of fluids in a day but your urine should stay clear in color it should not be dark in color so hydration is most important um take a good amount of natural calcium in your diet it should not be less than what is the recommended dietary allowance for you uh, a good source of uh, natural calcium is the dairy and dairy products it's a common milk and milk products can lead to kidney stone formation which is completely false third include a lot of fiber in your diet uh, that means lots of fruits and vegetables you don't need to uh, go for any expensive or fancy fruits like avocado or kiwi or whatever just eat regular seasonal fruits and vegetables like tomatoes or uh, cucumber or whatever you like again there is a myth that eating um, fruits and vegetables with seeds is going to uh, form kidney stones inside you this is a myth it's a completely wrong information you can take them safely these are the do's now don't if you have a kidney stone or if you had a kidney stone uh, there are certain things that you should cut down in your diet uh, most important of them is salt so you should restrict your salt intake you're not supposed to cut down it to zero just cut it down to something like one or one and a half teaspoon in a whole day avoid eating things which have high salt content like uh, potato chips um, namkeens uh, achar chutney papad those kind of things uh, cheese they have very high salt content second uh, reduce sugar in your diet these all dietary um, habits are good for your health in general for your cardiac health for um, for your weight management and for everything and also for kidney stone so reduce the amount of sugar in your diet there are certain food items which are known to increase the risk of kidney stone formation particularly in people who have a tendency to form kidney stones time and again these food items include spinach and sag that we usually take in uh, winters they are very very high in oxalate content whenever you are uh, going for spinach Uh, always keep the portion to the minimum maybe reduce the frequency you don't have to omit it completely from your diet but take it less frequently take in small portions um dry fruits all the nuts including peanuts 
they have very high oxalate content reduce the frequency and the portion black tea and green tea it depends on what type of green tea you are taking what type of black tea you are taking but in general because they have very high content of oxalate uh, don't um, overdo it maybe one or a half cup in a day is good for you not more than that don't take too much chocolates chocolates are again high in oxalates uh, it is said that high content of animal protein in your diet which includes eggs has a tendency to excrete a lot of acidic content in your urine and it contributes to the kidney stone formation so if if you uh, are a non vegetarian by diet um whenever you are taking animal protein make sure that your plate is balanced so there should be plant based proteins there should be animal protein and the uh, the portion should be uh, more towards the plant based less than 50% of protein should come from animal source you don't have to completely stop it just reduce the portion of it for people who have uric acid stones who have high uric acid in their blood um for them there are certain things like uh, red meat or mutton seafood fish um these are the three non vegetarian food which should be reduced to minimum because they uh, increase uric acid to very high levels yes these are the basic things apart from these uh, anyone who has kidney stones they should take care and not take supplements blindly without any advice supplements like vitamin c vitamin d calcium and protein supplements these supplements should be taken only when prescribed for the duration they are prescribed in the dosage they are prescribed not like habitually or because you just like popping pills uh, and not as a substitute for your natural diet the uh, kidney stone formation is reduced but honestly speaking um if a person has got genetic tendency to form kidney stones it is very difficult to bring down the risk to zero because despite every effort many of these patients will form another stone in next 5 to 10 years uh, but we should try to uh, reduce the chances and maybe if the stone is uh, despite everything forming again it is not very big in size it remains a small sand like particle which comes out in the urine uh, and we will be lucky if we don't form any in next few years but the risk will never be zero